Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 6. In this part, I'm going to describe to you the heliocentric model put forward by Copernicus that put the Sun at the center of our solar system. As I mentioned previously, Aristarchus, when he determined the relative sizes of the Sun, Moon, and Earth, believed the Sun, because it was so large, had to be at the center of our solar system. His ideas didn't take hold. The idea was reintroduced by Copernicus, and this time he introduced a more rational model. Even his idea was not embraced, although he's credited with coming up with a heliocentric cosmological model. Why is this important to orbital dynamics? An Earth-centric model is one way of looking at the solar system. In fact, we eventually have to convert other frames of reference to an Earth-centric frame since Earth is where we live. This means that an Earth-centric model is not wrong per se. I'm going to show you that a solar-centric solar system, heliocentrism, is a better way to look at the solar system. If the sun is not placed at the center of our solar system, then it's hard to develop laws of physics, which I'll get into later, that back up the orbital motions that we observe. Later discoveries by Kepler and Newton could only have happened with a heliocentric. As I mentioned in part one, ancient astronomers noticed that certain lights, as they call them, moved across the sky differently from the stars. This animation is the path of Mars against a stellar background from mid-October 1996 to late July 1997. They call these lights wanderers. In ancient Greek, the word for wanderer is planetes or planetes asterius. That's the root of our word planet. Notice that the path of Mars moves from east to west, changes direction, and then changes direction again. Let's be clear. The stars and the planets generally move in the night sky from east to west. Mars goes along with this east to west motion. Every night, however, it creeps a bit to the west, and then at some point it creeps eastward, and then it creeps westward again. The ancients wanted to understand this wandering motion. They also wanted to, to devise a system so they knew where to find the planets in the night sky on any given night. Five planets were visible in this way, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uranus and Neptune weren't discovered until later, Pluto much later. The ancients would have found them if they knew where to look. They're visible, but they're so far away they don't move much against the stellar background. Ptolemy was a mathematician, astronomer, geographer, astrologer, and poet. Hipparchus and later Ptolemy came up with a way to predict the motions of planets that accounted for their odd retrograde motion. The large circle is called a deferent. The smaller one is an epicycle. In this animation, you can see how this model accounts for the observed retrograde motion of the planets. More importantly, this method enabled Ptolemy to derive very accurate tables of the planet. planets, good enough for naked eye observations. Ptolemy's model is analogous to Fourier transforms. A Fourier transform decomposes a function of time, a signal, into the frequencies that make it up in a similar way to how a musical chord can be expressed as the frequencies or pitches of its constituent notes. There's a great video on YouTube that explains and demonstrates this. It's episode 205 of the Smart, Smarter Everyday series by Destin Wilson Sandlin. The video I'm showing here is an excerpt. What Destin teaches is that you can recreate almost any shape with a Fourier transform. In the animation I showed you, there was a single deferent in one epicycle. Ptolemy also used a single deferent, but added multiple epic cycles to increase the accuracy of his predictions. Each <coughs> epicycle added more accuracy. That's essentially what you do with a Fourier transform. You keep adding functions until the transform closely approximates the shape you're trying to recreate. Greek astronomers such as Hipparchus had produced geometric models for calculating celestial motions. Ptolemy developed astronomical models and convenient tables which could be used to compute the future or past position of the planets. Ptolemy synthesized and extended Hipparchus' system of epicycles and eccentric circles to explain his geocentric theory of the solar system. Ptolemy believed the planets and Sun orbited the Earth in the following order, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. This system became known as the Ptolemaic system and predicted the positions of the planets accurately enough for naked eye observations. The Ptolemaic system made some ridiculous predictions about their motions, such as that the distance of the moon should vary by a factor of two over its orbit. And you can see this erratic motion uh, 
from this animation. Well, the Ptolemaic method predicted the locations of planets in the night sky very well. Astronomers weren't able to devise laws of physics that explain the highly irregular motion. In fact, many believe that this kind of irregular motion was not likely. These were mathematical models used to predict the locations of planets in the night sky, not a model of their motion. Orbital dynamics relies on an underlying physical model. This one didn't work and yet persisted for centuries. Nicholas Copernicus was a Renaissance astronomer and the first person to formulate a comprehensive heliocentric cosmology which displaced the Earth from the center of the universe. Copernicus's epical book on the revolutions of the celestial spheres published just before his death is often regarded as the starting point of modern astronomy and the defining epiphany that began the scientific revolution. His heliocentric model with the sun at the center of the universe demonstrated that the observed motions of celestial objects can be explained without putting the earth at rest in the center of the universe. All, as Copernicus said in his book, all the spheres revolve around the sun as their midpoint and therefore the sun is the center of the universe. What appear to us as motions of the sun arise not from its motion, but from the motion of the earth and our sphere, which we revolve about the sun like any other planet. The earth has then more than one motion. The apparent retrograde and direct motion of the planets arises not from their motion, but from the earth. The motion of the earth alone therefore suffices to explain so many apparent inequalities in the heavens. Copernicus's theory was geometric and somewhat philosophical. He had no theory of physics to back it up. Copernicus's theory enabled later discoveries, but the actual discoveries would have to wait for Newton and Galileo. Copernicus explained the back and forth motion of the planets by putting the Earth in an interior orbit and another planet in an outer orbit, like I'm showing this animation. If you look closely at the gray planet on the zodiac strip at the bottom of this animation, you can see the back and forth motion. If we make the Earth an outer planet and the gray one an inner planet, like Earth and Venus, you'll see this back and forth motion as well. This is a much more intuitive explanation of the relative motions of the planets. The motions were now much simpler and much more intuitive. Here's a comparison of the Ptolemaic and Copernican systems. If we extend the line from the blue planet to the red in each case, you can see the two systems are remarkably similar. They don't predict the relative distance as well, but they do predict the relative direction of the red planet from the perspective of the blue planet. This is why the Ptolemaic system prevailed for so long. It was good at estimating locations of the planets relative to the Earth. Galileo was an Italian physicist, mathematician, astronomer, and philosopher who played a major role in the scientific revolution. His achievements include improvements to the telescope and consequent astronomical observations and support for Copernicanism. Galileo has been called the father of modern observational astronomy and the father of modern physics and the father of modern science. He built the first astronomical telescope based on designs um, invented by Hans Lippershey in the Netherlands and improved to the point where it provided 30 times animation. On 7 January 1610, Galileo observed with his telescope what he described at the time as three fixed stars totally invisible by their smallness, all close to Jupiter, and lying on a straight line through it. Observations on subsequent nights showed that the positions of these stars relative to Jupiter were changing in a way that would have been inexplicable if they'd really been fixed stars. On 10 January, Galileo noted that one of them had disappeared, an observation which he attributed to its being hidden behind Jupiter. Within a few days, he concluded that these stars were orbiting Jupiter. He had discovered three of Jupiter's four largest satellites or moons. He discovered the fourth on 13 January. These satellites are now called Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, later renamed to the Galilean satellites in his honor. His observations of the satellites of Jupiter created a revolution in astronomy. A planet with smaller planets orbiting it did not conform to the principles of Aristotelian cosmology, which held that all heavenly bodies should circle the Earth. Many astronomers and philosophers initially refused to believe that Galileo could have discovered such a thing. 
Galileo also observed Venus as it went through its phases. Here Venus and the Sun orbiting the, here's Venus and the Sun orbiting the Earth in a Ptolemaic system. Notice that you never see a full Venus. That isn't possible in this system. Notice too that when Venus is new, it's either very large or very small. It's at its largest when it's closest to the Earth and at its smallest when it's farthest from the Earth and closest to the Sun. In both cases, it's a new Venus, similar to a new moon that's totally dark. This is what the Ptolemaic system predicted. Here's what Galileo actually observed. Over the 224-day orbital period of Venus, Galileo observed it going through all phases, including full illumination. The Ptolemaic model didn't allow for that. The Copernican model did. Also notice that it's at its biggest, up to an arc minute, as it becomes new, and then shrinks when it becomes full. This could only happen if Venus and Earth orbited the Sun with Venus in an interior orbit. You could construct a Ptolemaic model that allowed for these phases, but it wouldn't predict the location of Venus with any accuracy. If you went with a model that predicted the locations of Venus, it didn't account for the phases. This discovery, along with moons orbiting Jupiter, led Galileo to believe that the Sun had to be at the center of the solar system. This is an edited excerpt from Wikipedia. Galileo's championing of heliocentrism was controversial. When most subscribed to either geocentrism or the Tychonic system, he met with opposition from astronomers who doubted heliocentrism due to the absence of an observed stellar parallax. The matter was investigated by the Roman Inquisition in 1615, which concluded that heliocentrism was false and contrary to scripture, placing works advocating the Copernican system on the index of banned books and forbidding Galileo from advocating heliocentrism. <clears throat> Galileo later defended his views in dialogue concerning the two chief world systems, which appeared to attack both Pope Urban VIII, alienating the Pope and the Jesuits who had both supported him up until that point. He was tried by the Holy Office and found vehemently suspect of heresy. He was forced to recant and spent the rest of his life under house arrest. According to popular legend, after recounting his theory, Galileo allegedly muttered the rebellious phrase, and yet it moves. But the only evidence that he ever said that comes from a 1640 paintings in which the words were hidden until restoration work in 1911. The first written account of the legend dates to a century after his death. So he probably didn't say it. Here's what an actual heliocentric model looks like. These are in the interior planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. This is the model we're used to and have pretty much accepted. This is the Copernican model that Aristarchus first suggested. Here's a real, geo here's a real geocentric model that predicts the locations of the sun and planets accurately. I put the Earth at the center of the solar system and have the Sun and planets orbiting it. The Ptolemaic model works that the planets are on a single deferent that's in line with the Sun's path around the Earth. Each planet then gets its own epicycle. Thank God Ptolemy didn't come up with this model. It would have been very accurate but not very intuitive. It's not that this geocentric model is wrong and the other heliocentric model is right. Both are valid models for predicting the locations of planets in the solar system. The heliocentric one is more intuitive and opens up more advanced theories of physics. It's a preferred model, not necessarily the right model. Stephen Hawking, in A Brief History of Time, states, a theory is a good theory if it satisfies two requirements. It must accurately <clears throat> describe a large class of observations on the basis of a model that contains only a few arbitrary elements and it must make definite predictions about the results of future observations. He goes on to state, any physical theory is always provisional in the sense that it's only hypothesis. You can never prove it. No matter how many times the results of experiments agree with some theory, you can never be sure that the next time the result will not contradict the theory. On the other hand, you can disprove a theory by finding any, even a single observation that disagrees with the predictions of the theory. The unprovable but falsifiable nature of theories is a necessary consequence of, inductive, of using inductive logic. 
The scientific philosophy didn't originate with Stephen Hawking. It was developed by Sir Karl Popper. He coined the term critical rationalism to describe his philosophy. Popper held that scientific theories are abstract in nature and can only be tested indirectly by reference to their implications. Scientific theory and human knowledge generally is irreducibly conjectural or hypothetical and is generated by the creative imagination in order to solve problems like how to determine the future positions of planets. No number of positive outcomes of experimental testing can confirm a scientific theory explicitly. A single counterexample can refute a theory. However, it shows the theory from which the implication is derived to be false. A theory being falsifiable does not mean it has been proven false. Rather, it means that it can be shown by observation or experiment to be false. Some use the term refutable, others use the term testable. Popper's asymmetry between verification and falsifiability lies at the heart of his philosophy of science. It inspired him to take falsifiability as his criterion of demarcation between what is and is not genuinely scientific. A theory should be considered scientific if and only if it is falsifiable, refutable, or testable. Asserting a belief that cannot be tested is thus not a scientific theory. The fourth criteria for scientific theories embraces a concept called Occam's razor. It's a term coined by philosophers that came after Sir William of Occam that refers to distinguishing between two hypotheses, either by shaving away unnecessary assumptions or cutting apart two similar conclusions. Of two equivalent theories or explanations, all other things being equal, the simpler one is preferred. Albert Einstein said, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. Copernicus wrote, the motions of the sun, moon, and other solar system planets can be calculated using a geocentric model with the Earth at the center or using a heliocentric model with the sun at the center. Both work, but the geocentric system requires many more assumptions than the heliocentric system. If you compare the math required for the um, Copernican system versus that required for the Ptolemaic system, Copernicus is far simpler. It's not that geocentrism is wrong, Heocentrism is simpler, more intuitive, and that's why it's preferred. Strictly speaking, the solar system is not static. It's orbiting the center of the galaxy. This video depicts the motion of the solar system through the galaxy. The plane of the ecliptic of the solar system is tilted at about 60 degrees, like is shown in this video. In the next part, I'm going to describe elliptical orbits. It's a key discovery of Johannes Kepler that gave a start to the study of orbital dynamics. Anyone who has studied orbital dynamics knows that the planets orbit the sun in elliptical orbits, but do they really? From this motion, you could argue they actually move in corkscrews. What do I want you to take away from this part? I want you to understand how long it took for the heliocentric model to take hold. It was suggested thousands of years ago and wasn't embraced until a few hundred years ago. Our understanding of orbital dynamics is based on very recent discoveries. I also want you to understand that all frames of reference or models have some validity. There isn't one correct frame of reference. There's simply one that makes the math and laws of physics simpler. Lastly, I'm touching on some astronomy here. You don't need to know a lot about astronomy to understand orbital dynamics, but it helps. Professor Alex Filipenko from UC Berkeley has a wonderful online course on astronomy that's offered through the great courses. I highly recommend it.